One of the most common questions I get asked by my students is Justin, what are your thoughts on gluten? Is it good? Is it bad? Should we be burning fields of wheat and eating nothing but chickpea noodles? In today's video, we're going to use the cadavers to look at the tissues involved with gluten sensitivity disorders. We'll be discussing celiac disease, wheat allergy, as well as non-celiac gluten sensitivity, or what I like to think of as the cause of the gluten-free craze. It's going to be a fun one. Let's do this. Gluten is probably a little more complicated than you think it is, and that's because gluten is not just one protein. It's actually a mixture of seed storage proteins, and this exact mixture depends on the source of the gluten. See, you find gluten in wheat, barley, rye, and oats, except the gluten, the specific proteins that make up the glutens, are different in all four of them, and they react differently inside of the human digestive tract, meaning some of them are going to be more reactive than others. The proteins that come from wheat gluten, however, tend to be the most reactive inside of the human digestive tract and are definitely going to be the most clinically relevant. So for today's video, I'm gonna be focusing specifically on wheat gluten proteins. So if you ever hear me say gluten, I'm really just talking about wheat gluten. But let's go ahead then and see what happens when you consume wheat. Let's go ahead and pretend that you are eating a bagel. So when you eat the bagel, obviously you're gonna put it inside of the oral cavity or what most people would just refer to as the mouth. Now, you are looking at a mid-sagittal cut, which means we've cut the head right down the middle like so, but that allows us to see some really cool anatomy such as the tongue here, up above we have the hard palate, and then just behind it you have the soft palate. Now what's missing from this particular cadaver are teeth. They were just removed, but teeth are obviously gonna be important for chewing. And I'm talking about chewing on purpose because gluten proteins, those seed storage proteins I mentioned earlier, are what provide or give the chewiness to the bagel. Now, these seed storage proteins specifically are gonna be called gliadin and glutenin. And these names are actually gonna be pretty important, especially gliadin. I'm gonna be saying it a lot in today's video. But what these proteins do is they provide like this elasticy, stretchy nature to the dough and bread. And when you are chewing it, you perceive it as chewiness. If you've ever had a gluten-free cookie, then you know exactly what I'm talking about because when there's a lack of gluten, they tend to crumble and fall apart. Now, people have gotten pretty creative in their, you know, baking with gluten-free products, but it still doesn't add up. It still will never compare, at least in my eyes, to a nice gluten-rich cookie. But let's say, again, you're eating a nice gluten-rich bagel, and as you're chewing it up, what you're also gonna do is put saliva in it. Now, saliva is capable of digestion, but it's not gonna be digesting the gluten proteins. What it is gonna start digesting is the starch that's also in the dough. And this is actually kind of interesting. There's a pretty unique YouTube video, I'll probably leave it in the description below, of where the chef actually grabs a ball of dough and then just washes out all the starch, and then what he's left with is essentially gluten. So gluten proteins are gonna be different than the starch of the dough, but saliva is capable of breaking down that starch, but not the protein. So what's gonna happen is you're just gonna be chewing through it, uh, the dough making all these smaller chunks, and then your tongue is going to push it back into your pharynx, which is this area here, and then it's gonna start sliding down your esophagus, or what probably most people would call the food tube. And from there, it's going to connect to the stomach, which is exactly what I have right here. Here Now, in my left hand, I'm actually holding the base of the esophagus, and then in my right hand, I'm holding the uh, beginning of the small intestine. So between them is the entirety of the stomach, and this is exactly how it would rest inside of the human being curving to the right. Now, the stomach is a storage organ that is also capable of mechanical and chemical digestion. And in fact, Jonathan did an entire video devoted to hydrochloric acid, which you're definitely gonna wanna check that out So after this video, so I'll leave a link to it. But besides hydrochloric acid, inside of the stomach is also going to be an enzyme called a protease that is specifically designed to break down proteins, and that enzyme is called pepsin. Now, it's a common misconception out there that gluten is not able to be broken down inside of the stomach. It can. It just doesn't get fully broken down. What happens is the pepsin enzyme is going to tackle the, glu the gluten and break it into those seed storage proteins gliadin and glutenin. See, you have to understand that proteins can be massive, so massive that they can't 
be absorbed in the intestines. So what you have to do is break them apart into their smallest possible components, which are called amino acids. And that's exactly what this protease, this pepsin enzyme, is attempting to do, but it can't do the entire job. It's only able to break it down into gliadin and glutenin, and then it's going to send it into the small intestines here. And personally, I think this is where things get really interesting. And if you think this is interesting, which you should, then you're probably gonna appreciate the sponsor of today's video, Acorns. Acorns is an app that makes it easy to save and invest every day in the background of life, starting with just your spare change, no expertise required. And by no expertise required, I mean that you can set up the Acorns app in under five minutes and begin investing with as little as $5. This can help build habits for your financial well-being that can have a big impact over time. Acorns also offers a checking account that saves and invests for you every time you spend. With this checking account, you'll get access to over 55,000 free ATMs with no overdraft fees, and you can also auto-invest a piece of every paycheck. Acorns is giving members $75 just to set up a direct debit on their checking account by December 31st. You'll get an Acorns debit card with your custom engraved signature, and you can instantly invest spare change with every swipe of the card. So download Acorns and start investing with just your spare change. You can even get a $10 bonus investment if you use our link to set up an account. Terms and conditions do apply. Visit get.acorns.com slash Institute of Human Anatomy, or you can just click the link in the description below. When the stomach empties its contents into the small intestine, it does so through this area right here called the pyloric sphincter. Now the sphincter is inside of a larger area called the pylorus. And pylorus just means gatekeeper because it's literally holding back the stomach acid and digestive enzymes from just randomly going into the intestine because that would be a, a big problem. But the pyloric sphincter is a very tough and strong sphincter. And what'll happen is it'll slowly open and let the gastric contents or really what's now called chyme. Chyme is going to be partially digested material. So in this instance, the bagel mixed with the stomach acid and the digestive enzymes. And it's going to release it into this area here. So I'm gonna do my best. Uh, I think it's about like this long. It, I know this all is one long tube, but we actually call this region from about here to here, the duodenum. And this is a very active area of the small intestine. I know it doesn't really look like much, but inside of here are gonna be several more proteases coming from the pancreas and even the lining of the intestine itself. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna now tackle and try to get that gliadin and glutenin. But here's the thing, even the proteases inside of the duodenum are not going to be able to fully break down the gliadin and glutenin proteins. Instead, it's just gonna create these amino acid fragments. And those amino acid fragments can still actually be too large to be properly absorbed, which can be a pretty big problem, especially for the fragments of the gliadin protein. Because in certain individuals, those gliadin fragments can invade the intestinal tissue, trigger an autoimmune response, which brings a rush of white blood cells to the area, which then cause inflammation atrophy of the actual intestinal tissue, which leads to weight loss, diarrhea, short stature, osteoporosis, and even more than that, that's what we call celiac disease. And I wanna go ahead and now take a deep dive and look inside of the intestinal tissue so we can get a better understanding of what I'm talking about. You're looking at a portion of the upper small intestine that we've cut a window into that allows us to reflect it open and you can see the inside of the small intestine. Now, the surface, the inner surface of the small intestine is a layer called the tunica mucosa. Now, tunica just means layer, mucosa means mucus. And that's exactly what it is, it's a mucus secreting layer. But you're also going to notice these lines going up. Those lines going up are what are called circular folds. And I can kind of like string them almost like a, like a guitar string. These are called circular folds. And what they do is they dramatically increase the total surface area of the inside of the small intestine. You have to understand that the small intestine is about nutrient absorption. So remember, at this point, we're gonna have that bagel chyme now flowing through here. So you can picture this bolus of chyme just going through the small intestine, running into the circular folds, and it actually helps to provide this corkscrew effect 
so it'll actually spin as it's being propelled through. But every bit of surface area that that chyme is able to come into contact with the, the wall of the small intestine, there are blood vessels in that wall. And that means the more surface area, the more nutrient absorption is going to occur. Circular folds give an increase of somewhere around three times the surface area. That's a pretty big and dramatic increase in surface area. But on top of that, there are also these tiny little structures that we unfortunately can't see here. These tiny little structures called villi or villus for singular. Now these are tiny finger-like projections that are going to have blood vessels and lymphatic vessels inside of them that are coming out. And what'll happen is the nutrients will get absorbed into the villus and then it'll drain into the larger blood vessels and eventually it'll take those nutrients to the liver. For most people on the planet, gliadin and glutenin are simply left unabsorbed and then they just pass through the small intestine to the large intestine and then are excreted with bowel movements. Although there is some interesting research coming out of Spain suggesting that gliadin and glutenin are actually fully capable of being broken down inside of the human digestive tract. And it seems like a lot of that might be happening inside of the feces in the large intestine, but some of it also could be happening in the small intestine. It's really interesting, but there needs to be more research performed to really figure out what's going on. So I'll be sure to keep you updated of any new developments. With celiac disease, however, the gliadin fragments are able to sneak into the wall of the intestine. Now the exact reason and how it's able to do this is actually hotly debated inside of nutritional sciences. But for our purposes, let's just go ahead and say that it is indeed able to sneak in. And once it gets in there, what's gonna happen is it's going to cause that autoimmune response like we spoke about. You're gonna get white blood cell activation, which is gonna stimulate inflammation, which is gonna cause more white blood cells. So you can try, kind of picture this whole area just becomes inflamed. And what that's actually going to do is have an effect on the villi. Remember those tiny little projections that we really can't see here, those are going to atrophy and get smaller and smaller, meaning that you're going to have a reduction in the total surface area of the intestine. And that's a problem because remember, we have digestive material going through here that's full of nutrients. And if they're not able to absorb those nutrients, that means you're gonna have more frequent and massive bowel movements. This is where the diarrhea is gonna to start to really come into play. And that's a big problem too, because then that can have an effect on the gut microbiota, the bacterial species living inside of the large intestine and some inside of the small intestine, and that can create even more gut issues. The thing is, celiac disease is a relatively rare disease, only affecting about 1% of the entire global population. So you might be wondering, well, what about the other 99%? What is it about those with celiac that the other 99% don't have? And what it really comes down to is a genetic predisposition. What we see with celiac patients is they have a different version of a gene and that different version makes it so white blood cells want to attack gliadin fragments. And that is pretty much it. But here's the really interesting part. 30 to 40% of the entire global population also has that genetic variant, and yet only 1% has celiac disease. This means there's something else at play here beyond just genetics. I mean, there could be, and I wouldn't be surprised if, there's other genes at play here playing an influential role, but it really seems like the big driver for what initiates and causes celiac disease are environmental factors. Determining those environmental factors though is actually pretty tough. And researchers have suspected for quite some time that how soon you introduce gluten into the diet for an infant, a toddler, or a child can play a significant role, if not outright, cause the celiac disease. The thing is though, when you look at the published research, it shows varying things. Some studies suggest that the longer you wait, the less likely that that child will develop celiac disease, while other studies show that that may just delay it, not outright prevent celiac from showing up. Other studies have suggested that a strong link exists between breastfeeding while you are introducing the gluten to the child, and maybe that could have some effect. In the end though, we're, the jury's still out. We're still trying to figure out exactly what role the, intro, the timing plays with uh, creating a celiac disease, but we're also trying to figure out the gut microbiota's role. So that's gonna be the bacterial species inside of your digestive tract because these species have 
unique byproducts that they could produce, and some of those byproducts could be proteases. They could have some effect on breaking down the gluten proteins. So we're starting to see that we need to do a lot more research into the gut microbiota and the overall microbiome, because that could play a giant role as an environmental factor. At the end of the day though, we're still looking for the exact cause or what separates that 1% from the 30 to 40%. So in order to determine if someone does in fact have celiac disease, what they're going to do is they're going to do a serology test, which is basically just looking for antibodies that are meant to attack the gliadin protein. Once they find that, they'll also then do an endoscopic uh, biopsy where they'll actually insert a tube, which will then go down to the duodenum and actually take a sample of the intestinal wall. With that, they're gonna be able to really determine whether or not you have celiac disease. They're also just gonna be looking to see if any improvements are made if you remove uh, gluten from the diet. And that's really how you treat celiac disease. That's the only thing we know of to this day is let's just remove gluten from the diet. It definitely does help improve the symptoms, if not outright remove the symptoms of those suffering from celiac disease. But at the same time, as soon as you reintroduce gluten to their diet, the celiac comes back full force, meaning that it's a treatment, but it's not a cure. So now let's talk about a wheat allergy. Now, a wheat allergy is far more simple than celiac disease. And that's because a wheat allergy is a food allergy. So if you've heard of other food allergies, then you're kind of understanding what's gonna happen with a wheat allergy. In this instance though, it's not just one protein that's the problem, it's many different wheat proteins. So with celiac, it was gliadin, but now you're allergic to many different wheat proteins. Upon consumption, antibodies are going to bind to the proteins and that's gonna initiate a white blood cell immunologic reaction. And it can be severe enough in some cases to cause what's called anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is a very severe allergic reaction. And in some cases, it can even be fatal if left untreated. Maybe some of you've heard like using epinephrine or an EpiPen to treat anaphylaxis. But here's the thing about a wheat allergy. It only affects, well, predominantly affects children and they tend to grow out of it. Not always, but they tend to grow out of it. On top of that, it affects probably somewhere around 1% or less of the population. But let's just say it's 1% of the population. That means a wheat allergy and celiac disease at most really only cover about 2% of the entire global population. However though, if you were to go to the grocery store, it would seem as though gluten is far, like the problems with gluten are far more reaching than just 2% of the population. I mean, even with 8 billion people on the planet, that's about 160 million individuals that's a, that's a lot of people, but it's 160 million compared to 8 billion is really not that many people. At least it shouldn't be enough to cause this huge gluten-free craze. So then you may be wondering, well, what's, what's everyone else, what's their problem? Well, that's where we get into the third one and it's easily the most controversial. Now we're talking about non-celiac gluten sensitivity. The reason why it's so controversial is because there aren't really any tests that can be performed, at least with any kind of consistency that show that there is a problem, right? That's not the case for celiac and wheat allergy. For celiac disease, you know, we could take a tissue biopsy of the duodenum and we can see very clearly that you have inflammation, you have high white blood cell count. Like we can see those markers, those biomarkers and say, hey, you have a problem here. With a wheat allergy, uh, I mean, literally all you have to do is give them wheat and you, once they go into anaphylactic shock, you're gonna see very quickly that they have a problem. But that's just not the case with non-celiac gluten sensitivity. If you were to ask me what's going on here, and this is where you're just getting into personal opinion, because if, it depends on who you ask about this. Some people are gonna be on either end of the spectrum where gluten is the worst thing that's ever happened in the history of nutrition and no one should ever touch it. And then you're gonna have others who are saying, look, gluten sensitivity is completely in your mind, it's completely made up, and there's nothing wrong with gluten. I think those are two opposite ends of the spectrum. Again, this is just my personal opinion here. I personally feel it's somewhere in between here. And it's not as though gluten may not have a problem because there is some interesting research that shows that it could be that gluten initiates what's called leaky gut. 
And even me just saying leaky gut, there are probably people in the comment section just ready. They're just at their keyboards or with their thumbs ready to start being like, leaky gut doesn't exist. Um, but there has been some interesting research that shows of a protein called zonulin. Zonulin, I think it was discovered in the past 20 years or so, but zonulin is what will actually, one of, there are probably more of these, but it's a protein that will actually cause the epithelium in the intestinal tract to become loose. And when it becomes loose, that increases permeability. Hyperpermeability, they call this leaky gut. Now, what some data suggests is that in the presence of gliadin, zonulin is upregulated, which means you get a looser gut, maybe the gliadin can go in and start causing some chaos. The thing is though, the individual still doesn't have celiac disease. Right? They didn't have that genetic predisposition for it, meaning they're not going to have the same attack, the same response as someone with celiac disease. But you could still make the argument that there's still something going on in the gut that can cause irritability, agitation, and some inflammation, and that can create those gastrointestinal problems. But again, if you're talking, to, if you're just asking my opinion. My opinion is that I, I'm not saying there isn't a problem with gluten, but I don't think it is the problem. In fact, I think there are other bigger problems that probably play a bigger role and gluten is just, you know, along for the ride. Meaning, we have to ask ourselves, what is the overall state of health based off of your standard Western diet or American diet? How much sleep are you getting? You know, how much exercise are you getting? Are you eating fruits and vegetables? What's your gut microbiota like? When was the last time you had, you know, broad spectrum antibiotics, right? There's so many questions that we need to be asking. There needs to be an overhaul on general health. And it's my suspicion, again, this is just Justin's opinion here. It's my suspicion that if, there an, if an overhaul on general health was taken, that individuals who are right now gluten sensitive would more likely to be, they respond beneficially to gluten after that, right? They'd start to be able to heal because I, I personally feel there's other things at play here and it's really just poor diet, poor sleeping habits, drinking too much alcohol, fill in the blank. When you add all that together, I'm not surprised that maybe gluten does have some kind of detrimental effect on the gastrointestinal tract. But to me, I don't think that's anything wrong inherently with gluten. But again, this is just my opinion. But if, even if I'm wrong, I mean, I don't think anyone's gonna argue with me that people need to eat more fruits and vegetables. Thanks again to the sponsor of today's video, Acorns. Be sure to click the link in the description below and get your $10 bonus investment as a gift for being an anatomy nerd like me. Remember, Acorns is giving members $75 just to set up a direct debit on their checking account by December 31st of 2021. As always, be sure to like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already. And if you're anything like me, you're probably gonna be suspicious of those bagels from here on out. But if you're also like me, you're probably still gonna eat it. Because while I may not really know if it's bad for me, I do know that it's delicious.